So now we have constructed a code or we have learned how to construct a code. And what we are going to do next is we're just going to construct a code and then look how this code will perform. So let's do this. We can construct a code and then we can decode it using message passing decoding. So what we do is the following. We carry out message passing decoding of a, oops, of a regular LDPC code and we stick with regular codes because the analysis will be very rather simple for regular codes. So we have a constructed 3.6 code and the code is of length n equals 200. We do the simulation over the binary erasure term. We know this code has a threshold of 0 0.4292. That's here, that's the threshold epsilon star. And we plot the code word error rate as a function of the erasure probability. So it's the error rate that we cannot recover the complete code word. If there's one residual erasure left in the code word, we declare a failure. And uh, we have this in a file. We use a slightly different decoder, this so-called peeling decoder. Um, this decoder is equivalent to the message passing decoder, um, but it's slightly simpler to implement on the binary erasure channel. It speeds up the decoding process, which is why I chose, why I did this. And, um, but the result is essentially the same. So when we carry out the simulation, we see the following. We see an error probability curve that decreases somewhat rapidly and then flattens out. We see that we get a so-called floor. And the coded error rate decreases only very, very slowly as a function of the erasure probability. So for instance, if we have an erasure probability of 10%, the code word error probability is still around 0.1%, 10 to the power minus 3, which may not be acceptable in many situations. So we would rather like to have something that looks like this and goes down and reaches low, erasure, low error probabilities. So what is going on here? So what happens with the code that we have constructed? Isn't it good? Does it have some issues? What are the issues? So we need to analyze the situation a little bit closer. And in order to do this analysis, what you usually do is you take a look at what happens here. So you look at how many erasures are left in the code words that I cannot decode. I look, we look at how many erasures there are left. So we do this analysis and we find out the following. So um, this just summarizes what I just said. So we show the code word error rate, PE, so the fraction of code words that cannot be fully recovered, which means that there is at least one residual erasure in the code. Word. And if we look closely at what happens in this error flow region, so in the error flow region of the curve, we find that there are often two erasures left in the code word that cannot re get recovered. The two erasures that cannot get recovered that are left. So why can we not recover those two erasures? In order to find this out, we need to look at the graph, the tenor graph. So what happens? Why is the message passing decoder not able to recover the situation? So what we do is we look at the subgraph corresponding to this two erased variable nodes. So this is what we have here. We just plot the portion of the tenor graph that corresponds to the two variable nodes that we cannot recover. So this is first variable node yi, or corresponding to the received value at position i, and the second one corresponding to the received value at position j. And we know the dashed lines, they denote erasures. And uh, we have the check nodes, they are connected to these two verb nodes, but they also have some other connections, which we do not show here. And now we have a situation, and we have an unrecoverable situation because of the following. These two verb nodes, they connect to a set of check nodes, and each check node has two 
connections to the set of variable nodes. If they are erased, what happens? If we recall the message passing guidelines, then we see that the following happens. So this check node wants to compute a message that goes back to variable node uh, I. So this message it wants to compute. So it looks at all the other messages. If any of the other, if all of the other messages are known, we can recover. But we have an erasure here, so we cannot recover the message. We need to pass an erasure. Same for any other message. We need to pass an erasure because there's one message that's erased. Same when you want to compute this message. If you want to compute this message. We look at all the other messages. And we find that this guy has an erasure, so we cannot compute or recover the value. We need to pass on an erasure to the other guy. So we are not able to recover this any of those outgoing messages. And the same situation happens for the other check nodes. So we always have two connected guys. So when we cover one, there is always one erasure left. So we can never recover a message because there are two erasures. There's an ambiguity. So we cannot know if the two values are either 0, 0 or 1, 1, or 1, 0 and 0, 1, depending on the case, depending on the other messages. There's always this ambiguity because we cannot find out the values of the two erasures because there are always two possibilities. So the check notes can not recover the erased messages. So we have a situation if two um, this, this is too much. So if two variable nodes are erased that connect two variable nodes are erased that connect to the same check nodes at least twice. And this is what we call a stopping set. And this is a situation that we cannot recover. So we can formally define a stopping set. And here we give the definition. So a stopping set S is a subset of the set of variable nodes. So V is the set of all the variable nodes. And a stopping set is a subset of V such that all the neighbors of the stopping set which means all the check nodes which are connected to S are connected to S at least twice. So there's never a check node that's only connected once because then if all the other variable nodes are recovered, we would be able to recover this one variable node as well. So uh, if we look at the code words and if we look at the non-zero positions of the code words, we take those variable nodes, they form a stopping set as well. So any code word of the code is a stopping set, and that makes sense because a stopping set means the decoder stops. When you have reached the code word, the decoder will stop. So uh, this is the definition of a stopping set. This is the most important part. So all check nodes which are connected to S are connected to S at least twice. We can formulate stopping sets, they have some properties. So for instance, if we have two stopping set, we take the union, this is another stopping set. Then we can, uh, we know also the empty set is a stopping set. So then it means that every subset of the variable nodes contains at least one stopping set, which could be the empty set. The most important property is however, the last one. So if you have a binary code, and we use this code to transmit over the binary erasure channel. We employ a message passing decoder until the code word has been recovered, until we fail to progress any further. So there are no changes from one iteration to the other one. So if then we denote by E the subset of the variable nodes that are initially erased, erased by the channel, then the set of erasures that remains when the decoder stops is the maximum stopping set that is inside the set of erased positions. 
So coming back or looking at an example. So here is a three, six regular code. And here we have a stopping set. We have an example of a stopping set with uh, three variable nodes, V7, V11, and V16. So we highlight those nodes here. We have a couple of neighbors. We have neighbors C1, C2, C3, and C6. And we see that each of those check nodes is connected at least twice to the variable nodes in the uh, stopping set. There's a stopping set that is not a code word. So if we set those three variable nodes to one and all the other variable nodes to zero, we'll not fulfill the check equations because then check, clarity check C2 is not fulfilled because it has one plus one plus one is going to be equal to one. So it will not be a code word, but it's a stopping set. And now if it happens that V7, V11, and V16 are erased, we cannot recover the code word with a message passing decoder. There's no way that the message passing decoder recovers this code. Word. So this is an example of a stopping set um, that is detrimental for the performance of the code. If it happens that those guys are erased, then we are not able to recover. Okay, so um, when we look at our simulation, we mostly saw stopping sets of size two. We had stopping sets with two variable nodes, V1 and Vj, similar to the one that we saw here. And if we look at the error patterns that we observe after decoding, this is something you have the source code, so you can take a look at how many erasures are left, and you will see that mostly it's going to be two. So we mostly find stopping sets of size. So we assume that the variable nodes that are erased are called vi and vj. And now we're going to calculate the probability that two randomly chosen variable nodes are being a stopping set. So we look at two variable nodes from our code. We pick variable node v1 variable node v2, and we calculate the probability that those form a stopping set. And for this, we introduce the so-called stopping set indicator, uij. uij is equal to 1 if vi and vj form a stopping set, and it's 0 if they do not form a stopping set. What we are interested in is the probability that uij is equal to 1, so it's the probability that vi and vj form a stopping set. Okay, so how do we calculate this probability? Well, we look at the construction, and we look at the construction that we saw in the previous video. So we look at the socket perspective that we employ during the random construction. So we uh, restrict ourselves to DVDC regular codes. Extending this to irregular code is possible, but it's going to be very, very nasty. And um, um, even we're going to see even doing this with regular codes is not necessarily trivial. It's okay, we're going to do it, but extending this is going to be quite hard. So what we do, is for each variable node vj and its uh, dv connected edges. So, S missing here. So we randomly choose a check node and an empty socket. So recall in the construction, we use this random permutation. So when we connect an edge, it means that we can choose an empty socket. This is like choosing a random permutation. You put some sockets and you randomly fill in those sockets until all the sockets are filled. And we do so until um, and also avoid parallel edges during the construction. So this is the situation that we have. We have um, VI is connected. So 
we have VI. VI is connected to check node C1, C2, and C3. And we assume that this is already the case without loss of generality. And we can also assume that um, VI occupies the first socket of C1, C2, and C3. And uh, this we can do without loss of generality because this is just an argument of a numbering argument. So V1 is connected to check nodes C1, C2, and C3. And V1 occupies the first socket. So now, in order to form a stopping set, we need to connect Vj to C1, C2, and C3. So Vj must connect to any of those empty sockets in C1, to any of those empty sockets in C2, and to any of those empty sockets in C3. And um, if it does not connect to one of those, then it's not going to be um, it's not going to be um, a stopping set. So the probability p u i j equal to one is obtained by looking at the case that v j connects with each of its three edges to c one, c two, and c three. And this is what we're going to calculate next. And let's, um, let's get started with this. So um, above me, we see the situation. This is what we have. And essentially, now it's a counting argument. So what we do is uh, we obtain P uij equals one using a counting argument. So we essentially count the number of possibilities to connect um, Vj. We follow a combinatorial argument. So we assume that Vi connects already to C1, C2, up to CDV. So now we generalize. This is what you see on top. It's just the case for variable of degree of three, but we generalize to DV variables. So first we count the ways that Vj can connect to C1 to CW in order to form a stopping set. So we start with the first edge. So we start with the first edge. First edge we can choose from EV check notes. And each of those check notes has DC minus one empty sockets. One socket is already occupied with the connection to VI, and we have DC minus one empty sockets. So then we look at edge two. So we can choose from, now one of those check nodes is already occupied. We cannot have parallel edges, so we cannot connect to the same check node. So we can choose from dv minus one check nodes and dc minus one empty sockets. So if you look at edge three, we can choose from dv minus two check nodes and each of those has dc minus one empty sockets. We do this up to edge dv. 
we can choose from one check node that is left, only one left after we have occupied dv minus one connections already. And this one check node again has dc minus one empty sockets. So in total, if we, if we multiply all the possibilities, so we need to multiply, it's a combinatorial argument. So in total, we have TSS, it's the number of possibilities, is equal to dc minus one to the power dv times dv factorial. So this is dv factorial, this is dv factorial, and this is dc minus one to the power dv. So that's the number of possibilities that we have here. So that was the easy part. Now we need to count all, we do a Laplace experiment. So the probability that we have a stopping set is divided by the possibilities that we generate a stopping set divided by all the possibilities we can connect. So now we count all the possibilities to connect VJ to any check node. So that's what we do next. So next we count all the possibilities to connect VJ to check nodes. And for this we assume, so we assume that L edges connect to a check node that is contained in the check nodes that are already occupied. So we have two kinds of check nodes. We have check nodes C1 to CDV that are already occupied with an edge, and we have the remaining check nodes. And we can form a mixture. Some of those edges can connect to the edges that are already occupied, and some can connect to other check nodes. And we denote by L the number of edges that connect already to those sockets that we already have occupied, and dB minus L edges connect to the remaining. And the remaining. dv minus l edges connect to the remaining check nodes which are c dv plus one up to cm we have total number of m check nodes and we know that m is equal to n and is the length of the code times dv divided by dc. Okay, so now we do the same exercise. We look at the possibilities. So we assume the first L edges, they connect um, to a check node from C1 to CDV, and the remaining edges connect to the remaining check nodes. So the first edge, this is edge, one, we can choose from, from dv check nodes. So that's any of the ones that we already connected to from the first set. And there we have dc minus one empty sockets. Then we have the second edge and uh, not going to look at those in detail. Um, so we have to we go up to edge number L. For edge number L, we can choose from dv minus L plus one check nodes. We have already 
occupied L minus one. So there are DB minus L plus one check nodes left. And each of those has DC minus one empty sockets. So these we call possibilities T1. Then we continue with edge L plus one. L plus one we can choose from, now we can choose from M minus DV check nodes. So now we look at the remaining check, not at the DV that are already occupied, but the M minus DV remaining check nodes that are not yet occupied. So we look at those, and for each of those, we can choose from DC empty sockets. And then we continue this up to edge DV. So we can choose from M minus DV minus DV minus L minus one. These are the ones that are already occupied. Check notes and DC empty sockets. So these are T2. So now we need, we can summarize everything. So now we can calculate the total number. So in total, we have TL is equal to T1 times T2. And there is something missing. What we have missing is DV choose L. Why is that? Because so far we have assumed that the first L edges connect to the DV check nodes that are already occupied, and the remaining connect uh, to the, um, the other check nodes. But we need to do this for all possibilities. So we have DV choose L. Sorry. We have DV choose L possibilities of selecting L edges. And it must not be the first L, it could be the first, the third, and so on. So we need to have DV choose L, which is because we need to select the first edges. So that's why we have this additional binomial. So now we can put everything together. So we can count T1, we can count T2, and then we multiply to get TL. So that's what we're going to do next. So T1 is obtained by, we have DC minus one empty sockets from which we can choose. And each of the L edges connects to DC minus one socket. So it's DC minus one power L times the first edge can choose from dv check notes, the second from dv minus one up to dv minus l plus one. And this is equal to dc minus one over l. And this term also looks vaguely familiar. This is something we know from combinatorics. You can say this is. Um, uh, let me check, this is dv, we have dv divided by dv minus l factorial. So it's dv factorial divided by dv minus l factorial. And this is equal to dc minus one power l times dv choose l times dv factorial. So we have a nice and complex expression for T1. Now we look at T2. So T2 
is equal to dc to the power dv minus l. That's the number of options for the stockets from which we can choose times m minus dv is the number of um, the number of check nodes from which we can choose. So for the first edge, we can choose from m minus dv check nodes. For the second, we are m minus dv minus one up to m minus dv minus dv minus l minus one. And this again, we can express using a combinatorial term. So this is dc to the power dv minus l. We can do the same trig as before. So this is equal to m minus dv factorial divided by m minus dv minus dv minus l uh, factorial times dv minus l factorial. And this is equal to, um, sorry, like this, this is what we have. And this is equal to dc to the power dv minus l times m minus dv choose dv minus l times dv minus l factorial. Okay, so now we can put everything together. We can say that tl is equal to t1 times t2 times this blue term, which is dv choose l. So let's put everything together. First the non-binomial terms and then the binomial terms. So this is equal to dc minus one power l times dc power dv minus l times dv choose l times m minus dv divided by dv minus, uh, choose dv minus l, not divided, so m minus dv choose dv minus l times the remaining terms that then we have dv factorial times dv minus l factorial times dv choose l, that's the blue term. And if we look closer, so we can replace dv choose l, this is equal to dv factorial divided by dv minus l factorial divided by l factorial. Um, oh, sorry, I made a mistake. Um, um, yes, this should be, so here I made a mistake. This should be L factorial, not DV factorial. This is L factorial because um, yeah, this is equal to DV factorial divided by DV minus L factorial. And here in the denominator, we call this, this is equal to DV factorial divided by DV minus L factorial divided by L factorial. So in order to get this term, I need to multiply with L factorial. So this is also why here we have L factorial. This L factorial is this guy is coming over here. So if we look at this, means we can simplify a few terms and we are remaining, we have a remaining term of, this is equal just to dv factorial. So putting everything together is equal to dv factorial times dc minus one power l times dc power dv minus l times dv choose l times m minus dv divided by Choose dv minus l, not divided, but choose dv minus l. So this 
So now, how do we get the total number of possibilities? Uh, I'm sorry for this. I just need. So how do we get the total number of possibilities? The total number of possibilities we not just now need to sum up over all possibilities L. So in total, we need to sum over L. So T, the number of total possibilities, is the sum from L going to zero from zero to dv over tl. So this is dv factorial, which we can factor out, times the sum from zero to dv of dc minus one power l times dc power dv minus l times dv choose l times m minus dv choose dv minus l. All right, so now we can finally obtain the probability of uij being equal to one. So the probability e uij being equal to one is obtained by assuming a Laplace experiment. So we can say P uij equals one is equal to TSS over T. And now we just insert what we have. So we recall, we can just go a few slides back. TSS was simple, that was dv factorial, that's dc minus one power dv. And T was more complicated, that was dv factorial, times the sum from zero to dv of dc minus one power l times dc power dv minus l times dv choose l times m minus dv choose dv minus l. So now we can simplify a little bit. We can cancel dv factorial. And in order to simplify, a little bit, we multiply the numerator by one over dc to the power dv. And of course, we need to multiply the denominator by the same, but we multiply by one over dc to the power l and one over times one over dc to the power dv minus l. So both are the same. So if we multiply both, we get one over dc power dv. The numerator and denominator are the same. So multiplying by this guy, this is equal to one. It doesn't change. But it helps us, um, help us in simplifying things. Because we can assign this, we can multiply this guy with this guy. And we can multiply this guy with this guy. And then we get the following. So then we get the following expression. So this is equal to one minus one over dc to the power dv. That's the numerator. So we just multiply with one over dc power dv here. And in denominator, we get the sum from L equals zero to dv. Then we put our combinatorial terms. So it's dv choose L times m minus dv divided by, or choose dv minus l, but not, not divided, m minus dv, choose dv minus l. And when we multiply dc, so the red term, this guy multiplied with this guy, this is just equal to one, so this term will vanish. Then we have this guy left, which is equal to one minus one over dc, to the power L. So this is the probability that uij, or the two variable nodes, are the stopping set. So we can give an approximation um, of this sum 
by looking at the denominator, if we're looking at the different terms of this summation, we see that these terms, the one for L equals zero, will be dominant. If we calculate those terms, the one for L equals zero, we'll have um, here the largest contribution, and this guy will also be largest for L equals zero. Because this is something that's between zero and one. So for L equals zero, this is the dominating term of the sum. So we can approximate the sum just with the dominating term with L equals zero. So this is what we are going to do next. Um, let me just quickly get this, uh, put this sum on the next slide. And then we can um, we'll have it here in the, it's a little bit large. Just going to put it over there so that we can uh, approximate it. Or we see what we are going to approximate. So, the sum, which means the sum in the denominator can be approximated by the dominating term. which is L equals zero. So um, you can also see this, so it is more likely to choose a check node that is not yet connected because there are much more of those tech nodes. So this leads to the approximation So the probability that uij is equal to 1 is approximate equal equal to, so the numerator is the same, it's 1 minus 1 over dc over dv. The denominator is then dv choose 0 times m minus dv choose dv times 1 minus 1 over dc to the power 0. This is just 1 minus 1 over dc to the power dv divided by m minus dv choose dv. Now, if you don't like binomial coefficients because you assume that they are too difficult to calculate, we can further simplify. So what we're going to do next is we're just going to write out the binomial coefficient and further simplify it. So it's equal to, um, just going to put dc minus one power dv divided by dc to the power dv. So this is this guy is equal to this guy. And now we're going to write down the binomial coefficient. So that's m minus dv factorial divided by dv factorial divided by m minus 2 dv factorial. And now let's just uh, write out what we have. And uh, so this is equal to dv factorial um, times dc minus 1 power dv divided by dc to the power dv. And then we have um, 1 divided by m minus dv times m minus dv minus 1 up to m 
minus dv minus dv. And if m is large, if m is much larger than dv, this is approximately equal to m minus dv to the power dv. So, um, yeah, this holds if m is significantly larger than dv. So we can um, simplify further. So we start from this guy and we just write down what we simplified. So means that the probability that uij is equal to one is approximately equal to dv factorial times dc minus one divided by dc times m minus dv to the power dv. This is equal to dv factorial. Now we insert the definition of m because we want an expression in terms of n. So this is dc minus 1 divided by dc and m is equal to n times dv divided by dc minus dv to the power dv. Now we just multiply and we can steps so it's dv factorial divided by dc minus one times or oh, dc times dc minus one divided by n times dv minus dv to the power dv and now we can just factor out dv so it's dv factorial times dc minus one divided by n minus dv dv to the power dv. So that's one possible approximation of this. So it's uh, you see it's rather tedious, but we get a nice looking approximation and a not too bad looking uh, general expression. So let's take a look at what we finally have. So this is the... Um, general approximation. So we have the probability of a size two stopping set. We can formulate this lemma, which we have just proven in, in fact, in the following way. So we have a regular DVDC LDPC code of length n constructed randomly such that we don't have parallel edges in the standard way. So now the probability that two randomly chosen variable nodes, vi and vj, that they form Sorry for the typos. This is a couple of new slides that I make and my spell checker um, failed on me. But they form a size two stopping set it's given by this expression. P uij being equal to one is given by this expression. So we inserted m and uh, we saw that we can approximate this expression contains a lot of binomial terms. And unfortunately, this looks rather like Van der Monde's um, equation, or Van der Monde identity, but we have this term. So we could also simplify this term, but this will lead to a rather crude approximation, which is why we don't do it. So for m large, this will be a much better approximation. So this is the approximation then. So it's dv factorial. This is dv is usually small, so it's rather small term, times this expression. So now we can use this to get an estimate of PE. So how do we estimate this? So PE is n choose 2. So we look at all possible combinations of two variable nodes. That is n choose 2 times probability that these two Vns form stopping set and are erased. Forming a stopping set and being erased are mutually exclusive events. They are statistically independent. 
So we can also write that they form a stopping set times the probability that they are erased. So um, when we only have stopping sets of size two, or a single stopping sets of stopping sets of size two, then we get this approximation PE size two SS is equal to n choose two. So we look at all possible combinations of choosing two variable nodes from our code times the probability that they form a stopping set times the probability that they are erased, and that is epsilon squared. They're erased with probability epsilon squared. So take all the combinations of two variable nodes, check if they form a stopping set, and then both variable nodes must be erased. Forming a stopping set and being erased is two exclude independent events, so we can multiply the probabilities. And then we just need to insert PUIJ from the previous uh, result, and uh, we are good to go. We can also look at the approximation just to see the behavior of what's going on. So um, the behavior that we see is the following. So we have n times n minus 1 divided by 2, that's n choose 2, times EV factorial times this guy. This guy looks like n to the power minus dv. So the whole, in terms of dv, the whole guy looks like n to the power 2 minus dv. That is important to remember. So if dv equals 3, the approximation behaves as O of 1 over n. 1 over n decreases very, very slowly. So it means we need a very large n in order to fulfill um, or to get a low error probability because it just decreases with 1 over n. If we increase dv, if dv is equal to 4, the approximation behaves as 1 over n squared, and it decreases much faster. So the error probability goes down much faster. So this is kind of in contradiction to the threshold. We saw for the threshold, dv equals 3 is much better. But the threshold assumes that we have no cycles, the graph is perfect, everything is perfect. And now here we see that dv equals 3 actually leads to rather bad codes in terms of stopping sets dv equals 4 will give us much, much better codes because the um, error probability will decrease much faster. We need smaller n. So that's something we're going to see in a little bit more detail later when we make this a little bit more rigorous. So um, here is what we get. So here we plot now the code rate error rate that we just calculated together with the two approximations, or with PE2 size 2 SS, that's this curve. And we can see that in the error flow region, this gives a very, very good approximation of what's going on. And we see that the real expression and the approximation, they are more or less similar. They are very, very close to each other. So we have very, very good approximation, even using this very crude approximation that we have. So we have a very, very good approximation. This allows us to calculate quickly um, for certain dv, for certain n of what's going to happen. And uh, this allows us to choose, if we have a, want to achieve a certain target error rate, this allows us to choose the specific n in order that we can achieve certain target error. So we are now at the end of this approximation. In the next video, we're going to look at how we can make this more rigorous. So with this, we are at the end of this part, and I'll see you in the next video.